I would advise that we try to move quickly to coalesce around those elements of the package that people agree on. That we know that we need uh, insurance reform. President Obama to George Stephanopoulos yesterday couldn't have been clearer. He is trying to find a different form of health care to get passed. He wants to move quickly. Where have we heard that before in health care? Top Line starts right now. Hello and welcome to ABCNews.com's Top Line. I'm David Chalian. And I'm Rick Klein. Each weekday we're bringing you the very latest political headlines, reporting, insight, analysis, everything you want and need to know about politics. And since it's changing about every second this week, it's Twitter.com slash the notes to follow along all the crazy chaos of Washington. What is your top line today, sir? Brown in town. Scott Brown said he wanted to come to Washington to change Washington, and boy, has he ever, even before he arrived today on Capitol Hill. It is a different atmosphere, a different legislative agenda. Politicians of all types on the Republican side are looking to Scott Brown and saying, I want to be a Scott Brown Republican, maybe too, if I could tap into some of this. He comes in with enormously high expectations for his tenure, and uh, it'd be interesting to watch his career. And, and watching just some of his initial words, I mean, he was praising the president's job on North Korea. He does great on North Korea. He says, I had a lot of people scratching their heads. Heads, really? Like what? What exactly? <laughs> about that one. We'll continue to watch Scott Brown's uh, trip through Capitol Hill today. Hanging by a thread. That is the status of health care reform right now. You heard President Obama leaning heavily into the idea of, of a pared down version of sorts, something back to core principles. A and then today we had Speaker Pelosi just say she does not have the votes to pass the Senate bill. So, Rick, to be clear, the House doesn't have the votes to pass the Senate bill. The president's instructed the Senate not to do anything further on health care until Brown is seated. So, therefore, they will not have a super majority. Uh, remember those House and Senate bills that got passed last year? They're not actually going to be what health care reform looks like. Yeah, whoops. And, and Harry Reid saying he wants to go slowly at the same time the president wants to go quickly. They're trying to find anything right now. I think the pause button is a way to think about it. They need to just see how this all settles out, what they can possibly get done. And, and they, Republicans may get their wish. We could be back at ground zero starting all over again with this. Floodgates, a bombshell of a ruling for the Supreme Court today that throws out much of the campaign finance restrictions that we've come to know very well over the previous several years. Uh, this one opens the door to corporate contributions, to union contributions, and it just really changes the whole electoral equation. For those who hated McCain-Feingold in the past, this guts really the, the main provisions of McCain-Feingold, and it is going to have an enormous impact. It's a nice cherry on top for Republicans this week. They, they, this is a, 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 a decision that they are touting, and it will have a huge impact. I mean, we will see corporations and labor unions advocating for candidates directly in ways that we haven't seen before in quite some time, I should say. And finally, baby daddy. Oh, yes. John Edwards, he just, you know, could not get away from this story in a coda to the political implosion that was John Edwards. Today, he releases a statement uh, announcing uh, the paternity that he is the father of the child uh, he had with his mistress, Riel Hunter, the baby uh, Quinn, who is almost two years old. This is trying to get ahead of uh, Andrew Young, the former Edwards aide who's written a book uh, who was going to take the fall as the, as the father of the baby. Uh, he's trying to get ahead of that a little bit here. Uh, yeah, and uh, it, it, this, this shock almost no one. Uh, I think at this point this has just become a sensationalistic story. There's not much to really care about uh, uh, John Edwards any longer, but uh, very striking. You know, he comes, has to come out and, and acknowledge this after being so strident in the past. It will be fascinating to watch him uh, continue to sort of spiral downward. But we move on to other topics. Uh, we are joined here today by the chairman of the National Endowment of the Arts, Rocco Landisman. Thank you very much for being here. You just spoke uh, to the U.S. Conference of Mayors there in town today uh, about a, a new initiative uh, you guys have going at the NEA. Let's talk about that first, and then we'll broaden out and talk about uh, sort of arts in America more generally. But, but what was it that you were talking to the Conference of Mayors about this morning? Well, the mayors are our natural allies as we're talking about programs uh, in the NEA that, that relate to neighborhood revitalization, urban development, economic recovery. The mayors really get the role of the arts in all this. Um, and we have, we have, a, we have an organization that, that we sponsor with the American Architectural Foundation and the U.S. Conference of Mayors called the Mayors Institute of City Design. And what we announced today were um, the availability of grants that we're, we're going to be making uh, to plan and design communities. And, and of course, this is something that the mayors um, really welcome. And, and what's the federal role in this? What do you hope to see from the federal government uh, to, to, to be part of an initiative like this? Well, we hope to jumpstart a lot of um, artistic activity within, within towns and cities. We know that if you bring art and artists into town, it changes those places. It changes their economies, uh, and it, it has a big effect on, on, uh, on economic growth. 
and this is something the mayors obviously are very connected to, and we're going to try to jump start that process as many, in as many places as we can possibly find. Uh, we'll, we'll find some, some, some opportunities where we think we have a reasonably good chance of success and start, and start doing it. Uh, I, I know uh, when you came to town in this new job that, uh, and saw the overall budget, you probably weren't so thrilled with the overall budget that the NEA had, and, and of course we'll be fighting for more money, but I, I want to kind of understand, in an economic downturn like this, when we're still in a big d recession, when you go to the White House and you go to the budget people and, and you ask for more arts funding, do they, are, are they, do they just say, sorry, man, there is nothing, we have got hundred, you know, millions and millions of people out of work, now is not the time for arts funding? What is the argument back to them? If we're a happier time, they might laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that uh, I realized very early on, uh, as soon as I was nominated, long before I was, I was confirmed, that if I went to Congress, to the administration, and said these arts organizations are in trouble, the San Francisco Mime Troupe is going to go out of business, the Pacific Opera needs $200,000 to survive, the City Opera in New York is in trouble, the response would be, that's terrible, that's a shame, but we have bigger priorities on our plate now than saving arts organizations. If, on the other hand, I could go to congressmen and to the uh, key players in the administration and say the arts are an important part of coming out of this recession, that they can play a vital role in economic recovery and in urban revitalization, then I think I have a different story. And then we get a different kind of a hearing, and I think that's what we're right in the middle of now. How important was the stimulus bill to some of the, to you guys and to some of the local folks that you deal with uh, in terms of grants, uh, money just kind of prompting up spending at a, a tough time? We got that money out the door very quickly, I think faster than anyone, and it saved jobs. There's no, there's no doubt about that. And if you are an arts organization, uh, you're, a, you're a theater and you've got a number of actors on the stage, well, there's not just those actors. There's, there are, there's the administration, the, the designers, the director, the stagehand, all the people that are connected to it. So it has a big multiplier effect, any job that you save or any money that you invest. And outside the theater, the people parking the cars in the parking lot, the restaurants, all of that, uh, there's a leveraging effect to any money spent in the arts. And it, it goes directly into the economy. This is not infrastructure build out that's gonna take three or four years. This is immediate. And I'm wondering, uh, perhaps maybe a bit more philosophically, in a, t in a downturn, in a recession, do you find that Americans turn to the arts or no? It's something that individual Americans don't, in, in other words, is this a time that they need to actually see what art does and sort of reflect our society or no? That's a luxury for them that they can't uh, incorporate into their lives in an economic downturn. Oh, like I don't this. think it's a luxury. I think it's a necessity. It's part of our humanity. And it, in fact, lifts us out of our exigent, quotidian, habitual existence. It enables us for at least a few moments to, to leave that, that very deterministic world that we normally inhabit. And I think the arts play a huge role in that and are, are really part of our humanity. It's more necessary than ever, I think. And, and has you seen any kind of upturn at the local arts level like we've seen in movie theater revenues? If, if people going to more, more shows, for instance? Bro Broadway revenue, uh, that's my territory. I right. know that, know that <laughs> Themed a little Broadway bit. Uh, has been quite healthy. And, and historically, and you go back to the uh, Great Depression, that uh, entertainment is, uh, is, is one area that tends to do pretty well during, during these times for, for the obvious reasons. And is it your sense you need more stimulus money? Do you want to see another round of, of grants? A lot of these dry up. This has been a pretty big problem for schools. You see at one time you can save the job for one year. What happens next year? Sure. And, and you mentioned schools. I mean, very often arts programs are the first thing cut, and we think they should be the last thing cut because they're the most, the most important. But yes, we need, we need I think, th those efforts to be sustained, and I think, uh, I think that's needed in the economy. And, and uh, in schools specifically, you partner with Secretary of Education Arne Duncan on arts, on arts education? Yes, I have a meeting coming up with him, in fact, next week. He has been a very passionate and articulate supporter of arts education, as has the First Lady, by the way. Mm -hmm. She's made a couple of speeches ab about this uh, very, very uh, powerfully. And um, we think arts education is a very important part of, 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 of total education, and we're pounding the table about that. Excellent. Rocco Landisman, the chairman of the National Endowment of the Arts, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate it. Thanks, David. Thanks, Rick.